my daughter is my firstborn, is my baby. Um, several months ago, I caught her in a lie. Um, this was the first time that I actually caught her lying. I mean, it was like I'm sure she's lied before, but this was the first time in a blatant lie. And after this OMG, my daughter is not a princess, is not perfect. OMG, my daughter is not perfect, that she's actually a sinner. After that realization, um, the next thought that came to me was, uh, what did you expect? She's your daughter, right? Um, and, and the way we do discipline in our house is we try not to discipline our kids when we are angry because we don't simply want to get angry with them. We want to correct them, to point them back to Jesus so that they know why what they did was wrong and so they could try to live better. So I had to wait a while so that my anger couldn't cool down because, um, listen, my world just fell apart when I realized that she wasn't perfect. Um, and so I had to wait for a while, calm down, made her sit in a room for about an hour or so, finally went into a room, and I had a conversation with her. Um, because this was the first time I caught her in a lie, the conversation went like this. You should not lie. If you lie, what happens is I can't trust you. I can't, I don't know if you're telling the truth, so I question everything you say. If you catch me lying, you can't trust me. You can't believe what I say is true. And also, we serve a God who doesn't lie. Can you imagine if God was constantly lying to us? What would life be like? So I'm trying to point her back to Jesus and having this conversation with her and talked with her and explained to her the consequences of lying and why she shouldn't do that. And then I told her this time, because this is the first time you've lied, you will escape without any major bodily harm to your body. But the next time you lie, I guarantee you we're not just going to have a nice conversation. We're not just going to sit here, you on one side and me on the other, and we're just not going to just talk about it. You will get punished. You will get spanked because I love you and I want to make sure you are doing what God calls you to do. And I said, if you continue to lie, you don't even want to know what I'm going to do to you. You don't want to know the extent of the punishment you're going to get. So she looks at me, Daddy, what's that going to be? You don't even want to know. Daddy, can you tell me a little bit? You have no idea how bad it's going to be. It's so bad, I don't even know what it is yet. And, and so you just don't want to know. I don't know if you parents have done that, but we don't say those kind of things because we want to take our children to the point of death, right? That's not why we do that. We do that because we want to warn them of the dangers of this to scare them, to give them a threat. The idea is that they would live their lives in such a way that they don't do things that will destroy their lives but they will live their lives in such a way that they will do things that are life-preserving. It's a warning. The warning is there so that you don't have to carry out the threat. That's what the threat is for. It's simply a warning. And in Hebrews 10, God gives us a warning. By the way, since then, my daughter, I haven't caught her in a lie. So either she really got the warning or... She's just really, really good at hiding it from me. I want to believe it's the former, um, that she's really good at listening to the warning, but then again, she is my daughter, right? I mean, you never know what you're going to get, especially from my background. But Hebrews 10, God gives us a warning. He gives us a warning for, as believers. I want you to look with me from verses 26 through 31. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment 
do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant which he has sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Here God warns us that we do not live presumptuously in sin against him so that we might not live our lives acting like the forgiveness he has given us in Christ is meaningless. He's warned us not to live in a way where we don't frequent the presence of God, but that we daily, day after day, frequent his presence. He don't want you to do your life in such a way that says, I don't care what you've said. I don't care what you've promised. I don't care what you've done. I just want to do things my way. I want to enjoy life the way I want to do it without any regard of what you have done for me. He's saying that if you live that way, you're trampling under the foot, under your feet, the Son of God. And you're taking the blood of Jesus that has offered you forgiveness of your sin, and you're saying that's meaningless, that's worthless, it has no value to your life. And if you live that way, the author is saying there is no benefit of forgiveness of sins available to you. And the only thing you have in that scenario is a fearful expectation of the terrifying judgment of God in your life. What does that mean? What are you talking about? Remember the Old Testament? Someone sinned against God. Often they didn't survive that day. They would sometimes die on the spot. Sometimes if there was two or three witnesses, the people would come out and stone them. They would die immediately for their sins. They were killed without mercy. How much more severe do you think it would be for someone who's should, who someone should experience judgment, who takes Jesus Christ the high priest, the son of God, who gave himself so that we might be forgiven. And we trample him under our feet. We take his blood that washes us clean, that makes us new, and treats us as if it's some unclean, common, profane piece of material. How much more severe of a judgment does someone like that deserve? What does that mean? What am I saying? It's you don't want to know. You don't want to know how bad it will be. You don't want to know what you will experience if you do this. What do you know that's worse than what's happened in the Old Testament, than when they died physically, when they broke the law of Moses? What's going to happen to someone who tramples Jesus under their feet and lives their lives in presumptuous sin? It's going to be a lot worse than that. You don't want to know. What's worse than physical death? What does that mean? What does that look like? A lot of things can be worse than physical death. Paul talks in the New Testament about individuals being turned over to Satan, that every piece of benefit or forgiveness that was given to them is taken from them, that's removed from their experience. No protection, no provision, no presence of God in their lives, a complete ravaging of their lives by Satan so that at their end, their soul can be delivered and saved. Listen, that doesn't sound fun. If you think you can live in sin and God's just going to accept it, he's not. That's not the God that we serve. Or maybe... It's Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 when someone builds on the foundation of Jesus. They build on the foundation, and at the time of judgment, everything that we do will be judged. And if you've done things based not on your forgiveness of Christ, not because you've been forgiven, but for your own work, the Bible says it will be burned. But when you do things for God's glory and for God's honor, and when you live your life in such a way that, God, I do everything on the basis of the fact that you have forgiven me. The way I talk is because you've forgiven me. The way I treat my spouse is on the basis of my forgiveness. The way I love my neighbors is on the basis of my forgiveness. The way I love my enemies is on the basis of my forgiveness. And God says, when you do, you, when you live your life in, on the basis of the forgiveness I have given you, it will be put through the fire and it will come out like gold. Listen, but if it's not done on that way and it's burned, that doesn't sound good either. That doesn't sound fun either. There are a lot of things that can happen to us that are far worse than physical death that we don't even want to begin to fathom. God would dispense on us 
if we live presumptuously in light of the work that Jesus has done in our lives? What's worse than physical death? What about separation from God for eternity? Wait a minute. Is that what the author is saying here? The author is throwing out a question. And in a sense, he's saying, you don't want to know how bad it is. Listen, there were some folks that were there at the church in Rome. They heard about Jesus. They heard about the change that he could do in their lives. They kept hearing. They kept experiencing. But they never surrendered their lives to Jesus. You can't presume that just because you're here, your life is different. It has to change you from the inside out. But listen, do you know what's better? It's to stay in the faith because God is the one who will take out vengeance. He's the one who will repay. He's the one who will judge all people. And it is terrifying to fall into the hands of a living God. And you don't have to come into his hands with presumptuous sins like that. Don't do it. Stay in the faith. Stay in the faith. Pursue Jesus with all of your life. Pursue him. Don't assume that God will just accept whatever you do. Just love him for what he has done for you and let him change how you live. The warning is given. It's not given so that we will respond to it in fear. But let me be honest. When I read this text, it's a little scary. When I read what the author writes, it creates a little bit of fear in me. Doesn't it make you scared? That there is vengeance from God? Think about your life. Think about my life. Am I anywhere close to the perfection that God demands from me? I'm not. I'm a mess. I'm constantly running to God for repentance, for forgiveness. Guess what? When I read this, I have a sense of fear. And this warning is there to give us that sense of fear. And that doesn't make sense. The Bible says that perfect love actually casts out fear. James, 1 John 4, 18. Well, I'm hearing this verse, and I feel afraid. There's a problem with 1 John, isn't there? That perfect love is supposed to cast out my fear. What do I do with that? I understand that the blood of Jesus has washed me clean once and for all, that now I can enter into the holy place, the presence of God, I can have a relationship with him. And when I walk by faith into the holy of holies, and I stay in that faith, and I am embracing the forgiveness of Jesus, guess what? I get to experience a love relationship with God day after day. And when I'm in a relationship with God, when I am walking with God, when I'm struggling with whatever sins I'm struggling with, I am quick to run to Jesus because I know he offers forgiveness for my sins. I run to Jesus because I know that it is only by him that I can break free from the power of sin. I run to Jesus because my hope, my trust, my faith is not in my abilities, but it is in the power of his forgiveness. And so I run trusting that God can change me. And I'm struggling forward in faith. And I'm living in this love relationship with God, trying to live for him, and I'm struggling. You know what happens? The fear of judgment is gone. And the assurance of forgiveness just escalates. Because it's a biblical assurance. To be in a relationship with God, to experience his presence, knowing that you have been forgiven, is an assurance that only God can give you. But if you step outside of that relationship and you just live in presumptuous sin, willingly neglecting the laws of God, saying, I don't care what the Bible says, I don't care what Jesus did for me. I don't care what you've promised in my life. I'm just going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. Listen, you should be afraid. You are assuming something about God that is not in the Bible. Because the moment you are saved, there's a transformation that happens in your life that says, I want to live my life in such a way that brings glory and honor to Jesus. 
You should be afraid. God wants you to hear this warning this morning and feel fear so that you will turn and you will come back to the joy of walking with Jesus. The warning is not given to hurt you. The warning is given to help you. Listen, when I grab my child and I say, don't touch the fire, it will hurt you. It's not because I delight in the or else part or warning or punishment. It's because I want the child to experience the blessing of not having done things that will destroy them. When you pick up a product in your house and you look at the warning sign and there's a big skeleton X there and it says poison, you don't look at it and say, oh, wow, look, it's poison, and then open the lid and chug it down your mouth. That would be stupid. The warning is there to warn you not to mess with it. The warning is there to warn you to say, put this away from your children. Keep it away from harm where it can harm people. Use it only for the purpose that it was created. That's what the warning sign is there for. When you're driving down the road and you see a warning sign that says, slow down, there's a cliff ahead. You don't all of a sudden pick up the speed and say, let's see how far and how fast I can fly off the cliff. That's stupid. You will plummet to your death. The warning is there so that you will take heed so that you can live your life so that you don't destroy it, so that you find life. There's a story in Acts 17. Paul is on a ship. He's been taken captive, and the ship is bound for a wreck. A storm comes, and Paul tells all the crew on the ship, listen, God is going to protect us. God will keep us, that no one is going to die. Everyone will be safe. You can bank on it. It is a promise from God. But there were a few people on the ship that got nervous when they saw the storm coming. They began to doubt whether or not they were going to be rescued. So they see the lifeboats that are available. They start to get into those things, and they try to save themselves. Paul talks to the captain and the other leaders, and he says, listen, if they try to rescue themselves, they will destroy their own lives. You've got to cut the lifeboats and get rid of it. So the captain and the others, um, they cut the rope so that everyone has to stay on board of the ship. And through the fear of dying in the context of a warning that was given to them, they were able to maintain their trust in God, and they were all saved because of a warning. Listen, there's only one way to be saved eternally. There's not multiple ways. There's only one way, and that is through Jesus. Jesus is the ship that we are on board. We have to make the decision every day to cut off every other single rope or lifeline that we think will offer us something better than Jesus. Listen, there is nothing better than Jesus. Nothing. So we have to stay in the ship of living our faith in Christ, cutting every other rope by any other means, every means possible, and stay in the faith because that's the only way to be saved. See, what God has done is that He has given you all of the grace to stay on the ship. Some of the grace that He has given you is in the context of a warning. He warned you. You don't even want to know what it would be like off the ship. Don't abandon the faith or else. You don't know what's going to happen to you. Some of the grace that he's given you is through promises. If you stay in the faith, there's going to be a great reward for you. You don't want to miss on the benefits of your forgiveness. Listen, don't depart from Jesus. You don't want to experience what life is like without him. Don't forget about Jesus. You don't want to miss all that he has to offer you. He wants you to stay in faith in Christ in the ship no matter what. He has used every means to secure our faith in Christ so that we can endure, so that we can stay day after day trusting in Jesus. And that's what the author does in the second portion of our text in verses 31 and 32 till the end of the passage. He's telling these guys, this is what you've done. This is how you were able to live. You've been able to endure. Look with me, verse 32. But recall the former days when you were enlightened, 
You endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourself had a better possession and an abiding one. Listen, don't throw away your confidence. It has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, the coming one will come. He will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But, verse 39, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. That's not us. But of those who have faith and persevere till the end. Do you hear the confidence in that? You've lost your possessions. You've lost, you've been thrown in prison. You've had family members die for their faith. But there is confidence that we will endure. We'll make it till the end. Why is he so confident? Why can he make such a bold statement there? It's because he knows who Jesus is. It's because he knows who Christ is. He's the high priest who came to earth, the Son of God, who lived a perfect life, who shed his blood, so that when we place our faith in him, we'll be completely, perfectly, forever forgiven. Given entrance into the presence of God so that we might know him and we might walk with him. Listen, he who knows Christ who Christ is, and because he knows who Christ is, and because he knows who Christ is, he is confident that they won't shrink back like the previous generations did in the wilderness. They will press on toward in faith and repentance and experience the benefits of forgiveness. Stay in the faith because you know who Jesus is. Respond to the warning and cling to Jesus. Respond to the promise of the reward and cling to Jesus. Whatever you do, respond by clinging to Jesus. And when you cling to Jesus, when he is your all in all, when he is your delight, when he is your joy, when he is your satisfaction, when he is the one that you want to please, when he is the one that you want to serve, when you are clinging to him, no matter what you go through in life, you will make it. You will make it. Why? Because he is faithful. It's not necessarily, I say cling to Jesus. It's not necessarily that you're holding on tightly to him. That's one aspect of it. But there's another beautiful aspect of there's a God who is holding on to you. And he is never letting you go. Cling to Jesus. I read a letter this week from... I'm. I find my illustrations in the weirdest places, but there was a letter from the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, and it was a warning letter that was given to a chocolate candy company. On the top of the letter, it says, warning letter. I mean, that's all it says. This was sent to a chocolate candy company, and the chocolate candy company gets this warning from the FDA, and it says, your, com your company has products that are misbranded. Your products have labeling that is false and misleading. You should take prompt action to correct these violations. You need to make sure you are compliant with all applicable laws and regulations. Failure to do so will result in regulatory actions without further notice. I'm going to come in and I'm going to shut you down. Warning. 
the chocolate factory decided to write a letter back to the FDA. And the response letter was their response to the warning. The FDA says you have a problem with your labels. The label says that you are saying something on the outside that's not necessarily true on the inside. So what's on the inside is not being communicated on by what's on the outside. What's on the outside is not reflecting what's on the inside. And the chocolate company sends a letter and says, what needs to be fixed has been fixed. We have responded. We have taken the corrective action. Listen, the Jesus that is on the inside of you needs to be reflective on the outside of you. The God who has saved you, the God who has paid a great price for your salvation, and he doesn't just sit up there watching you, but he actually comes and takes residence in you, that needs to be reflective on the outside. See, that's what God has done. He's written you a warning letter. And he said, if what is happening on the outside is not reflecting on what Jesus has done on the inside, I'm going to give you a warning. I'm going to take action. And you don't even want to know what that will be. You can read the Bible and find out what I'm capable of, I am the one who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Or you can live your life in trust, knowing that I have what is best for you. I have, I know what I'm doing in your life, that you don't have to live in rebellion and sin. You can trust me with your life. I have saved you for eternity, but I'm also the God that can work in your present. And you can let my life and my presence in your life completely transform you. See, we all have a chance this morning to read the warning letter. And we also have a chance to write a response. And my prayer is that our response would be that because of Jesus, because of what he's done, I want to live my life in such a way where God would look and say, He's different. He's been changed, and he lives it out everywhere he goes. She's salt. She's light. My presence is flowing out of her. People know that I have transformed her. People see that my presence is on her life. People see that he belongs to me. Listen, if what's on the inside of you is not reflective on the outside, there's a warning letter for you. And God says, you don't even want to know. And he does that because he's gracious. Because he loves you. Because he has a greater purpose and a plan for your life than you can ever dream or imagine. Because he brings you into contexts and situations where he wants you to use your life so that other people can be blessed. Blessed. Other lives can be changed. But what's on the inside needs to be reflected on the outside. So I'm going to invite you this morning to respond to God's warning. This warning is not to make you feel guilty or try to make you do more stuff or good things. The warning is there to make you respond to love Jesus more. Because the warning is, you're not taking what I've done for you seriously. And so it's to reflect on what has he done for you. I've paid 
a great price for you. I gave my life for you. I left the comforts of heaven because I love you. The warning is there to draw you back to your first love in Jesus. It's not that you live your life in fear so that you will live your life in love and awe of what God has done in your life. So this morning, I want to ask you to respond, to reflect. If you are living your life in such a way that what God has done on the inside is not reflective on the outside, you know who you are. The Holy Spirit's dealing with you. Would you respond to Jesus? Would you let him change? Would you allow him to work in your life? The warning's there because he loves you. The warning's there because he wants to see you in a new way. In a few moments, we're going to come to the table where we celebrate everything that Jesus has done for us. We're going to celebrate the fact that he died to forgive us of our sins. We're going to celebrate the fact that he now lives inside of us to help us live the life we're called to live. And we're going to celebrate the fact that there's a day where he's coming, where we get to experience Jesus forever and ever and ever. That's what this table is about that we're about to celebrate. I'm going to invite you to examine your heart. Examine your actions, your attitudes, your affections from this past week. See if there's anything in you that's not from Jesus. How do you know? The Holy Spirit will tell you. Let the Holy Spirit convict you of things in your life that point you back to yourself and not to Jesus. And would you repent? And having received the forgiveness that God offers, I'm going to invite you to come to the table to grab the elements, to celebrate the work of Jesus in your life. And as we, in a, the way we do communion here is we grab the elements, and at, after everyone is grabbed, Ben will lead us to take the elements together. But reflect on your heart. Reflect on your attitudes and your affections. And then would you... Um, Come grab the elements and let's worship this great Savior together. Father, I ask, would your Holy Spirit examine my heart to see if there's any ways that I am presumptuously living in a way that I don't care what you've said or I don't care what you've done or I don't care what your word says, but I'm just trying to do things my own way. And if there are things, God, would you bring me to repentance? Not to guilt, but to a point of knowing that you can help. To a place where I put my trust and my faith and my confidence in you. Father, thank you that you don't just save us for eternity, but you are daily working in us. That you never give up on us that you're constantly transforming us. So we come to this table this morning with worship, thanking you that you are faithful, that you are good, and that we could trust you with our lives. In Jesus' name.